Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Marilyn Gagno, president of the Graduate School of Education Alumni Association at Rutgers the State University of New Jersey. I would like to welcome you to the second in our Coffee and Conversation series. There are approximately 100 of you attending tonight, and I would like to welcome those of you from nearby, as well as those of you from far distance from Rutgers and New Jersey both. So welcome to you all. Many of you were with us last month for our first series in the Coffee and Conversation program. And there we had a panelist who were discussing the opening of school in their respective educational settings throughout the state during the stressful time of the pandemic. Tonight, our program is very different. We have a book author talk, and we are most excited about this. The book, which is entitled Freedom Lessons, was penned by Eileen Harrison Sanchez. Eileen now is retired after a very successful career in education of 40 years, starting as a teacher and ending as a district administrator. Now, Eileen spends her time reading and writing, enjoying her grandchildren, going to museums and traveling, and she regards herself as a perennial, which she defines as a person with a no age mindset. Pretty good, right? So Freedom Lessons. This is a novel, a work of fiction, but as you hear this evening, it's going to stretch far beyond that. This is the story of a girl named Colleen in Louisiana in 1969. Colleen, a young, white, female teacher, finds herself in the unfamiliar culture of a small southern town and its unwritten rules as the town surrenders to mandated school integration. The story is told alternately by Colleen by Frank, a black high school athlete, and Evelyn, a black teacher. It is the story of how the lives of these three individuals, how they differ, but yet they intersect similarly in a way when our, nature fa when our nation faced, as it does today, issues of race, unity, and identity. Before the program officially gets started, and I turn it over to Eileen, just a few housekeeping items. We are muting audio and visual so that the focus can be on the speakers and the content that they are sharing with us. Toward the end of the program, the chat box will be open to you so that you can submit questions. However, many of you already submitted questions and we will try to get to as many of them as we can this evening. For those of you who are, are who are want a professional development certificate, please reach out to us at our Gmail account, g s e a a r u at gmail.com. And everyone, please check our website for our exciting programs next month and to come. Our website is r u g s e a a dot org. And I hope you will pencil us in on your calendar for our November program, which will feature one of our doctoral dissertation awardees. Her program is entitled Queerly Belonging, and she will share with us her research on the LBGQ community. On behalf of the Executive Board of the Graduate School of Education Alumni Association and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute, for Leadership, Equity, and Justice at Rutgers University. I thank you for joining us this evening. Sit back, enjoy your cup of coffee and the wonderful conversation that follows. Eileen, it's all yours. Okay, well, welcome. And thank you for the, uh, for the, for the invitation to come and speak uh, from the Graduate School of Education Alumni Group and from the Proctor Institute. I appreciate this opportunity. And it's my pleasure to be speaking tonight with Michael Hicks, Dr. Michael Hicks. He is currently the only tenured track African-American male professor at Centenary College of Louisiana, 
where he is an assistant professor of education. He's a member of the Diversity Scholars Network at the National Center for Institutional Diversity from the University of Michigan. In September of 2018, he was awarded the Maddie Allen Broyles Inaugural Year Research Eminent Scholars Endowed Chair. He has been a top 10 rated professor presenter at the National Charter Schools Conference, and he frequently trains and teaches faculties in Louisiana and nationally. Michael's work is centered in issues of race, identity, and culture, both in and out of the classroom. Dr. Hicks describes himself as a bridge builder. And I'm just, so I'm sorry, I'm just switching my view a little. Uh, I can't see Michael, there he is. Um, so Michael, as I started to tell you, is, describes himself as a bridge builder, and that's exactly how I feel about tonight's conversation. Um, we hope that our conversation will build bridges between school communities. The, uh, this date of October 29th is, is a particularly special day. It's the anniversary of the Alexander V. Holmes, a little known, but one of the most significant Supreme Court rulings in school desegregation. On this date in 1969, the United States Supreme Court ordered the immediate end of desegregation to terminate dual systems, dual school systems at once. And that decision is central for the story that I tell in Freedom Lessons. I wrote about the impact of that decision on one school year over 50 years ago. And that year is also known as the crossover in Louisiana parishes. The book is a fictionalized version of events I experienced as a young teacher. The decision began uh, as earlier lawsuits did with black parents frustrated with the delaying tactics of their school districts. In 1968, Beatrice Alexander filed suit against the Holmes County Board of Education. Eight other similar lawsuits were consolidated with Alexander's and district court hearings began in October of 1968. Over that next year, decisions were made in favor of the school districts, then they were challenged, then they were found in favor of the plaintiffs, then the deadlines were lifted, then the plaintiffs appealed, and finally they were heard at the highest court. Dr. Hicks and I were connected through a mutual friend's dissertation. Dr. Gary Clark wrote, even the books were separate, it was court-mandated desegregation and educators' professional lives during the Caddo crossover of 1969-1970. Dr. Clark's dissertation is available from ProQuest.com in the resources. And for those of you not familiar with Caddo is a parish, like a county in New Jersey, uh, and so that was a large school district. So Michael, there you are. Can you tell us a little bit more about the crossover and why was the 50th year important to you as a, to, to, to commemorate? Um, you know, I guess there's significance in, in, in symbols. And so 50th year, you know, um, I guess as we approached uh, 2020, um, it was first uh, introduced to me by uh, a, a former, uh, well, a retired educator and a, a member of my church who um, uh, has been a student and, a, uh, and an administrator in Caddo and who first kind of turned my attention on the crossover. And so once I was introduced to this uh, period of our uh, American history uh, in education, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to see how it shaped the current school system in Caddo. And so I, I began right there, I mean, I began defining the crossover as, you know, something kind of academic, you know, and a, a, a response to um, or how districts or systems responded to what ultimately ended up as forced uh, uh, integra integration. 
um, subsequent to Brown. And so I started with this kind of uh, emic, not edict, um, uh, approach to it. Um, that's how I began. But, you know, this is a, a, a living phenomenon. It's, it's very real. And so my definition is insignificant, or rather, it's insufficient. Um, I'm not a, a, a desegregation scholar. Uh, there, there are several legal scholars and historians uh, who can uh, speak with more depth about the crossover. You know, I guess um, from a little boy, and I want to go back a little, little bit, I wanted to wanted to know why I would see men, black men uh, in my community wear these letterman jackets of schools that no longer exist. Um, so maybe it started right there, you know, my quest to try to understand what this phenomena is. But, you know, as I, as I learned, you know, people like Gary, who took a look at uh, what teaching was like during the crossover, you know, he would define uh, the crossover probably from that perspective right, from, from a mix of black and white teachers, you know, because different things were required from different people. Uh, and he would talk about what the crossover meant for them. He talked about those teachers uh, who were chosen to cross over from all black schools. And I'm reminded of a, of a story of a, uh, of, a, of a black teacher who uh, for decades taught in a, uh, in a monumental way in a black school here in, in Caddo Parish and didn't realize until she was selected to cross over and go teach at a at an integrated school that, uh, that that teachers of her day taught from textbooks with the answers in the back. You know, she was head of a math department and had 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 to computate or her compute rather all of those answers on her own. And so he would tell it from that story. But then there are other folk, um, you know, and I'm reminded because I've talked to him this week, Arlene, I'm reminded of 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 Ron Cochran, and Ron was a student at Captain Treve High School, the school that I graduated from here in Caddo Parish, and the school where uh, I have a daughter who uh, is a senior and who will also be a proud graduate. But, but he would define the crossover as uh, probably starting with that fateful day in February of his senior year, when after having gone to Eden Gardens Elementary and Eden Gardens Junior High and Eden Gardens Senior High, you know, it was that fateful day that he was ripped from those confines of that neighborhood school where he was taught by people who looked like him, people who he saw in church, he saw in the grocery store, he saw at Boy Scouts or whatever. Uh, and he was uh, sent his senior year to a high school that uh, in no, uh, no mistaken <laughs> ways uh, to comprehend it was not welcoming. And so, you know, in order to give justice um, uh, to those uh, students, um, I just have to say that the crossover, you know, is hard to define. You know, I, I teach race, uh, and race is hard to define, right? I mean, uh, it, it, it's such a complex phenomenon that involves um, uh, an understanding um, uh, of a little bit of history, a little bit of social context. Well, the crossover is just that. So I don't want to offer, Eileen, that I can give you a package definition of it. It means different things. Uh, to different people. Um, I hope we've, we've taken something so real, and even now in 2020, something so raw, and I hope we were able to um, um, create a learning experience from, of it, uh, from it. And I'm, I'm actually convinced that we did, Eileen. Well, you know, I, it was, it was a, a word for me, um, the term you know, when I, I, I can explain now that uh, I taught in the black school in the town that my husband was in the army and I lived there for one year with him and I taught in the black school. I was hired in August and on October 29th, uh, there was a decision made that I didn't know anything about. Uh, and, but it affected my, my uh, teaching and my students and the whole community because that following November 4th, just a few days later, the parish that I was working in made a different decision. They didn't, in, when I started to do the research to understand really the fuller story about that year, uh, that because I was only in Louisiana teaching that one year, I, I realized that it had a name. This, this is a term, this crossover, but what it meant in my initial understanding was that some districts decided to put 
black teachers into white schools and and white teachers into black schools and in that way they were starting to literally cross over for me that's not what happened the school was closed on november 4th we were invited into a meeting and told to uh, get our personal belongings and tomorrow the next day to report to the to the white school and so i went from a typical classroom of 24 students and i was put into a trailer that was on the back lawn it wasn't a, a teaching trailer uh, portable classroom that we have today uh, it was a, a much different uh, experience and we were just put, so we started on that very next day and so the when i started to find out about the rest of the story not just my story that's when i found this term the crossover and so that's why i was curious about you know what does it mean to you and that's how you know every time we talk michael <laughs> you and i just we learn from each other and um you know so i just it was very hard for me that that year and uh it, obviously it stayed with me long enough that I decided to write a book <laughs> so yeah and I, I think you know you know in in even trying to define a or give a definition of it you know you just you said it Eileen I mean you gave an example of how it can mean so many things you know uh, there were white administrators you know who saw the unfairness of, of what um, uh, of those uh, those students being ripped, and who who did all they could in in that time in society, you know, to bring a, a you know, some administrators brought a spiritual uh, uh, feeling to their campus. You know, there were some uh, some black teachers who had to teach under conditions that you know the the candidates that I'm preparing right now will never know mm -hmm. about. So I mean, we're talking about um, we're talking about. Uh, a host of narratives and, and, and because I approach education from a critical race perspective Eileen I want you to understand that you know your story is important and I think it's um, I think it was not just by coincidence um, that that we connected and I hope um, I hope we get to talk about that you just touched on it you know we uh, um, you know part of this conversation should be uh, should shed light on on the wisdom uh, that can be transferred, you know, in, in places where we have intergenerational learning, you know, because there were some things you learned, you know, um, some things that you saw, you know, that that touched me in a way that I was able to teach these undergraduate students, you know, they, you know, it's easy for us to just kind of storybook stuff, and you want to think in your mind that 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 people in places that that uphold some of these you know, uh, inherently unfair systems. Well, in your mind, you want to think of them as explicitly racist people and, 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 and explicitly racist places, you know, but we know that people make systems just as a spider makes a spider web. You know, individual people make systems. And so, you know, your story gave me an opportunity to transfer that lesson, if you will, to undergraduates in a way that perhaps, you know, other scholarship may not have been able to do. You know, I include the arts in my teaching because the arts can do things that sometimes, sometimes even the most uh, uh, strenuous uh, empirical research can't do. You know, it can connect to, to that person and it can push issues forward in a way that, um, um, that I find very uh, um, um, unique. And so um, I think that's the beauty of this ongoing relationship we've started because you decided you know, to take pen to paper, you know, decades later and to use that manifestation, even though it was a little scary, even though it is a little uh, scary, but to use that to, to try to teach a lesson of, uh, of fairness. You know, you're teaching that prejudice can be taught and it can be upheld. Yeah, right. Well, that's one of my lessons. Prejudice is <laughs> learned. If you read the book, you'll see that at the end. But I, I wanted to remember that uh, when I was looking, when I decided to do this, it was it started out as a memoir, and then when I when I started to write it, I realized that I only knew my story. I was only there for one year, 
um, at the end of that year, uh, I'll share now, it's, uh, I was told two weeks before the school year ended that I had to retain my entire class of black, 30 black children. And two years, two weeks before the school year ended. And that was devastating for me as a teacher, for my students, for their families. They were questioning me. That was very, very difficult. And that's uh, an, another story. But the point is, uh, you could read it in the book, but um, the point is that that never left me. That unfairness, that was an in, in injustice, that, um, and I didn't realize how important that um, experience was. It certainly, I knew it in my personal and professional life, but I was at a conference in uh, about 10 years ago and in New Orleans and I shared with my friends while I was there that I had taught in Louisiana and I told them the story and they were quite shocked. Many of them knew me well and I had never shared that story before and as we talked about it I realized how how important that was that I witnessed history and I really felt a responsibility to share my story. So as I started to write my story, I needed to do a lot of research. Um, and that's how I came across Gary's uh, dissertation. And just the title, even the books were separate, was just so striking. And as I read the different narratives of the, the teachers and administrators that he interviewed, it was the first time that I had ever shared or felt an, a validation of what I had gone through that other teachers, black and white teachers, had experienced similar stories, similar experiences, and the challenge of that particular year. And it was, you know, one, one of the interviewees was Marie, and Marie was the one that had really gave him the title of his, uh, his dissertation. Marie went into a a stock room to get some extra books for her teacher for her students and when she saw the books she went to take them and the woman that was escorting her through said no 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 those are those are for the white students and she had to go into a different stock room to get the books for the black students and my experience was that the books that i had in my classroom were not well cared for were well they i'm sorry they were well cared for they weren't uh, they were old, they were uh, out of date. I didn't have teacher guides. When you were talking before about the woman that had to do the calculations in her head, that's because she didn't have a teacher's guide or they didn't have any other, they just worked from the book. And they, they, they existed. They weren't given that resource. Right. And, and Eileen, that, that question still exists in, in schools, not just in Caddo Parish, but that question of resource. And yeah, we may not block the, the closet to the good resources. You know, we may not say they're for the white students. We have other uh, uh, education ease to use now. You know what I mean? We've, we've nuanced that tracking and that, you know, that quote, on th those things that start, you know, as my colleague reminds me, just with simple, well-intentioned ability grouping. You know, we formalize some of those, uh, some of those locking out uh, of resources. Uh, didn't mean to interrupt you, Eileen, but that's what's so uh, that's what's so provocative about the conversation we started. Uh, you know, when I presented this to the uh, to the superintendent and its staff, and you know, I guess my additional, or rather, my initial thought uh, was to was to was to because of my definition, because the of the importance of the fifty year mark, and I wanted to include this some sort of way in the. Uh, in the social studies curriculum of this parish to get these youngsters to understand, you know, but, but in some ways I failed on that, but in some ways, you know, I've realized that I was at the precipice of a, uh, of an education that would, um, uh, that may not end until, you know, um, uh, my dying day. Uh, it's an education uh, like the one we're, we're having right now where I can learn from from the, the, the counter narratives of other stories that even my training haven't, uh, hasn't uh, given me the proper uh, insight 
uh, to value and to use. Yeah, you you made me think before when you were you were talking about something that made me remember that I like to say when I do talk about my book and uh, that <laughs> we these laws that you know from 1954, 1964, and then it took all those years for this today the decision the anniversary of the alexander v holmes supreme court decision it took 15 years for schools to be finally not you know finally integrated it was against the law finally and so that in the case of my the district that i worked in they uh would have lost federal funds that was the that was by December of that year in from 1954 to 1969 that was 15 years they had they had to comply and so there were decisions made across the south that uh of people in different districts did it all different ways and just the the way that i experienced it and then when you talked about your your the class the uh, man that graduated that year that 1970 like that was the reason that i wrote about the students that i wanted to understand what happened to the high school students they lost all their privileges they lost their spots on the football teams and the basketball teams the black students when they moved into that school and that's why that man was uh, understandably that was uh, a, a, a terrible way to end his career. Yeah, uh, he, all not, the, they missed the, they lot they missed their proms. They missed graduating from their own school. And in fact, when I went back to the town that I taught in, and to do the research, I met the principal of the that school, and she invited me in, and we spoke at length. When she found out why I was there, she was very welcoming. And I asked her, whatever happened to the second graders and the third graders and uh, in the elementary schools that were retained that year? And she told me she knew nothing about that. And, uh, but she was going to help me see if we could find some class lists or something. What she did know was that her brother was a senior in high school that year. And he was not going to graduate at all that at the end of the year that was the decision just like the second graders were retained they were going to retain the high school seniors and the parents and the in the black community were uh, very against that uh, of course and they fought it and they did they did win that argument and the students did graduate from high school but it was those stories when i started to hear about what was it like for the students and then what was it like were the colleagues, the teachers in the in the black school that when we moved over into the white school, that was, um, I had a classroom, but the majority of the black teachers were second teachers in the white teachers classroom, and they were not welcomed. Um, some of them had their own classrooms, there were three of us on four, four trailers on the back lawn and two of the teachers on the trailers were white teachers like myself and then um a, and then two black teachers but we had all black classes in the trailers on the lawn so it it wasn't it was a very challenging year and so many stories and um the more that i talk with people and we we just i'm hearing different stories i had a conversation a book talk and there was a woman that um, i asked a question what teacher really influenced you and so it was a zoom chat and also i was getting this in in writing and she said her high school english teacher and she named dr um oh what was uh, now i forgot his name uh that's terrible. Oh, no, Dr. Horton. John Horton. Okay. Dr. Horton. <laughs> he, and I said, I know him. Like it, because he was in the dissertation. And his story was there. And this was a white woman 
who was not happy that these students moved into her class or that these teachers moved into her school at the time. But she, that's her best memory, her best teacher. So I hope that you are able to tell him that story. Do you? Yeah, I, I, I definitely will. Yeah. 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 You know, and that story, you know, that specific story, you know, that just highlights, you know, the, the many narratives involved. You know, uh, Don Horton was a, a teacher of great respect. Uh, and I want to say he taught at Booker T. Washington High School, an all-black high school. And so he might have been part of that group. Imagine that that principal at that time who, who, who wanted to keep the very best instructors, of course, on his campus. But but when when told that some of his faculty would have to cross over, of course he wanted to send the very best. And so that must have, you know, those stories have to be told as well. How did those administrators balance that? And then for Don Horton, as as we both read, in Gary's work, you know, what he experienced when he went to Captain Treve, a literature teacher, you know, who, you know, was initially challenged, you know, on his on his knowledge of Chaucer, you know, and, and initially seen as suspect, someone who was held in such high, high esteem, you know, um, their implications for folk like me who study and research these themes, you know, but again, Eileen, you just reminded us, these stories are about real people you know, real lives. And so I guess I want to min- I want to talk a little about a bit about the book. I want to whet some more folks' appetite. Uh, there's certainly, I saw when we started some folk uh, in this uh, Zoom tonight who are close to this class and close uh, to the lessons I tried to extend from your book. I know uh, I see my good friend, Judy Williams, who along with Roxanne Johnson, who you both, who you met when you came to Shreveport. Uh, I see her on this Zoom and I'm reminded that there were lessons not only for me and my undergraduates, uh, but lessons for an entire community. So Eileen, can we talk a little bit about that? I'd, I'd like to let the people know uh, what it was like when you came back to Louisiana um, uh, under my invitation to just come and speak about this book. You know, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about, you know, what that meant to you, what lessons you you taught, but what lessons you learned. It was, it was such a wonderful opportunity to, to have these students read the book and to see the history from 50 years earlier, because they had, these are 18 and 19 year olds. They had no idea that, and they could really understand Frank's story, the high school uh, senior, and they could put themselves in his place. And and that's what I I hope that, you know, historical fiction can create empathy and understanding when you can put yourself in someone else's shoes. And that's what I had hoped that I could do with the book. And I... The, having those the students, the conversations that we had, the questions, I remember we were sitting uh, in a large room and in a big square, and they just, I, the conversation just went back and forth with questions. They, they were, um, the girls were interested in the romance between uh, Colleen and her, and her husband, but there wasn't really too much of that, but um, they, they saw a different part of the story that I had never intended to uh, really have in there. Uh, but they, they were very, I, I remember one student saying to me that she just never understood how racist her family was, how prejudiced her family was until she had this class with you and started to have the conversations, not just my book. I mean, you had a lot of other uh, resources that they were talking about, but I think that I it seemed that my the story the book made it more personal, made it more human for them to really uh, understand how what it was like. And even today, when I speak, I speak with adults in this part of uh, the country, and they, they just don't understand that. What do you mean the schools were weren't integrated? in 1969. 
I mean, they were in New Jersey. We had integrated schools. Not that there were um, an overrepresentation of minorities in certain classes or in certain towns, but there was integration. So, I mean, when I went to the, into the South and I saw signs, whites only, and, you know, they were still present. Or if the sign wasn't there, you felt like it was there. It, it was just, it was a very uh, uh, a, a rude awakening, I suppose, or, you know, a bit, lots of lessons I learned. So it just having the conversation with the students kind of healed me a bit to just feel that we can learn from each other. We can learn generations. I, I, I said earlier, I, felt, I really felt a responsibility to tell this story. I wasn't sure who would want to listen to it. Um, and I realized that like my family didn't even know the whole story. My siblings, my daughters, uh, now my grandchildren. So we're all having really good conversations that we didn't have before because of my book. So um, I don't know, I kind of answered your question, but I went all different ways. No, I guess you answered it perfectly. And I guess really, you know, <laughs> you're the bridge builder, um, you know, by writing that book, um, you know, wow. Eileen, I, I see it, um, you know, this is personal, and I guess there are only a hundred of our closest friends on here, so I can, <laughs> I can say this, but, you know, um, I, I saw a therapeutic theme to your visit. Um, you know, you, you know, I'm like the students, these were characters I had read about. To meet you and, and Judge Sanchez, who, you know, who now, you know, I don't, I don't call Judge, I call him Manny. He's a friend now. But to, to watch you and Manny, you know, to watch Manny, you know, escort you here and to watch him carefully, you know, uh, watch you explore these issues with me. I mean, it was therapeutic for you. I don't think that's a... Um, um, I don't think that's a small thing to say that, that there's some people, you know, with stories inside and, and, and even if they present them in an artistic way, you know, it'll give, re it'll give rise to that feeling that, that they may have been a part of something, uh, uh, not good. You know, you, you embrace that and you were willing, you know, so Eileen, sometimes, you know, you know, in times, uh, it's happened since we met. You know, in times of my, you know, in my professional career, when I can acquiesce for comfort's sake, I think about you and I think about you didn't need this. You know, you didn't need the added pressure of, of some students distorting the lesson that you were able to teach with this book. You know, you didn't need that. You had a distinguished career in education. You could have put a cap on it. But the fact that you, you know, as the teacher, the teacher inside of you said, no, there are more lessons for me to teach. You know, even in my 60s, there are more lessons for me to teach. You know, I'm inspired by that. So I, what I saw was, was kind of a, 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 almost a, a beginning timidity of should I do this? And, and then I just saw a resolute uh, uh, Eileen take, take charge. And, and, and even though you weren't sure, and, and yeah, there was some tension in that room. I mean, we had folks that, you know, who had experienced this phenomenon that you had written about you know, on a very personal level, you know, and I, and I saw you navigate that, you know, I saw you navigate that with, with confidence and boldness. And so, um, you know, as I continue to learn from you, Eileen, I want to, you know, I want to tell you that with, again, a hundred of our closest friends listening, yeah. um, you know, because I want you to own that, you know, whenever we talk about issues of, of race or identity and, and for you, you know, to, to, to specifically talk about, you know, these sto this story, these stories of these characters that you've researched and that, you know, are part of your experience, you know, it's uncomfortable, you know, so the world tells us don't do it. You know, let's, let's stay in the, in the comfortable confines of, of, of where we are, you know, and for some of us who haven't ventured out into more cosmopolitan places, you know, some of us who have remained in spaces where that, that black and white, that, that, that resource, no resource, is just as visceral and real as it was in 1969. You know, it's important that we have bold people like you, you know, because one day somebody's gonna poke the box and Cato's gonna be ready. 
you know, I, you know, I talked to you that I failed in my effort to what I initially wanted to do. You know, I approached the news media and I got to say it was the black news uh, outlet here in Cattle, the Shreveport Sun and their publisher who first embraced this. You know, but there were things that I, there, there may have been mistakes. You know, I'm actually signed up for a webinar, I think tomorrow uh, at the Proctor Institute is sponsoring, I'm sponsoring uh, about engaging the media in your, in your research. And this was a, you know, a very uh, participatory action <laughs> research kind of project. And so um, the, you know, the way we met and, and, and the way, you know, Dr. Chris Cicchetti, who I believe is on this Zoom, you know, uh, encouraged me to extend an invitation you know, uh, because he's a big part of this story. And the way, you know, you re first responded, I don't know if you remember this, Eileen, but you you actually called me back after I invited you. Uh, you know, you, I think you had to test my validity. You thought you were being prank called. <laughs> Do you remember that? Well, I have to say, if you, uh, you, the fact that you, you know, when a white woman is writing in black voices, okay, um, I was going to get some pushback and, and what I, as I was writing it, what was stay true was it was my story and I felt a responsibility to tell it. And I also felt a responsibility to tell the story of the black characters in the story. They were that they, their, that story was need was necessary. So some pushback, but when you embraced the idea, you took a risk as well. That you were going, that you said, this is a, this is a story that maybe you needed to hear, you were willing to hear it from me. And that's the build, bridge building that we're doing, that we're talking and to, for me to go back to Louisiana after, you know, my husband said, we are never going back to Louisiana again. <laughs> so, two years in the army was enough. Um, but we went back and, and it's been, it's been such a rich experience. I've, I've met so many wonderful people that have expanded my, my learning, my conversations. But I'm looking at the time. It's 7:47, um, and I don't know if we want to put out questions from the our hundred closest friends. <laughs> yeah, why don't we? Why don't we? Uh, if Brandy is available, why don't we see if we have some good some good questions in the chat? Yeah. I know I have some students in this Zoom, Brandy, and so. You know, I, I have a, I'm very student centered. So if there's some silliness or some emojis in the chat box, it's just a reflection of the teaching that I've probably given them. But uh, if you can give us some questions, I'd love to see what the- Well, I think that we have to open the chat box before- It's uh, open. It is open. So open um, we can, we can, if it is open now, okay. we can uh, have it open for written questions. And uh, as time allows, we'll do our best to answer them. And uh, I just would like to say before we take a question that um, all these laws that we're talking about, I started to say this before, I don't think I finished saying it. We have laws that protect our civil rights, but laws don't change people's opinion. Mm. People do. And that's why we need to have these conversations. And some of them are hard to have, but if we we must we must do that. We have to we have to find that. And and individual stories are I think how we can make those connections. And we also have to really be listeners, not just speakers. So maybe we can listen to some questions. Sure. Uh, we have one question right now. What are the freedom lessons? Oh, <laughs> well, there are five freedom lessons, but I'd like to uh, point out two of them, and I, I mentioned them already. Uh, one of them is prejudice is taught and learned, and we need to be sure that we don't, that we, we need to be aware of that. Every action that you have, um, you're that's your responsibility to uh, 
to teach it, teach the openness and be open to others. Um, the other freedom lesson that I, I guess just writing my book um, did this, uh, we need to take risks. We need to um, we need to change people's opinions then you have to you have to step out and and, and do something that uh, have the courage to to make individual actions that you just have everybody has it chance every day um, as a grandparent as a teacher as a as a friend as um, you have that opportunity to make some change around the the issues that we have in our society today. We need to be open and listen to people. So um, any other questions there, Brandy? We actually have another. Um, are the two of you building bridges? Well, Michael, what do you think? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was, um, you know, I was concerned that, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm a, third generation educator in my family and I'm, I'm a member of the education community in this town and I was concerned that you know um, really that I would be seen as a sellout you know because uh, you know when you talk about the crossover and I'm talking about how it happened at Captain Tree but there are other black schools that experienced that crossover they experienced it at different times but but it was significant nonetheless schools like Union um, um, Valencia uh, you know, that was the risk um, that was so real to me. And so I guess once I, you know, kind of worked that out internally, you know, I was able to see those connections. I was able to see, wow, you know, just by talking about this, I'm, I, I'm giving the voice to some, some coaches and some athletic directors who, you know, saw a unique way that sports was able to connect, uh, um, uh, the dots on some of these things in a way where teachers in an in a all academic setting weren't able to do. You know, I was giving voice to some staff members because we had a crossover of faculties and staff. And I was giving voice to some of those stories. And some of those stories, you know, um, uh, you know, had understanding, you know, at a time when, when we weren't supposed to understand each other. So because I'm aware of those beautiful stories that, that, that have emerged, you know, from something as, as, as tragically painful, you know, I, I want to say without a doubt, I'm a bridge builder. And I'm building bridges, not only for my students, but for myself. You know, I hope to be like Eileen. I hope to be, you know, uh, uh, in my grandparenting age. And I hope to, 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 to take lessons, you know, from what this text um, and this experience of using it, you know, in the classroom uh, on this college campus. I want to take these lessons at that time uh, uh, and build new, uh, better lessons. So, Eileen, I, I can definitely say that, you know, you, you're the one who labeled me as a bridge builder, but I'll accept it. Do you label, do you accept that label, Eileen? I, I think that you and I built the bridge from New Jersey to Louisiana. You know, it's, it's just, it, it, it has given me the courage to go and speak and I'll tell a bridge that i Built. I was at. I was speaking about my book, introducing it to a large group of, of white, all white women, and to be honest, they weren't that receptive to the topic, and but I was invited. I gave my little talk. Uh, at the end, I there was a one of the people won the book, and she said thank you and all, and then we sat down and we had uh, some. Uh, a reception for my friend that invited me. At the end of that evening, this woman that won the book came over to me and she said, I want to thank you for this book. When uh, my father came from South Africa when he was 18, uh, I'm one of five children. We grew up in the neighboring town and she was a woman about my age. And she said, when we were children, we were not allowed to speak to any black people. I mean, she went to school, it was an integrated school district. And she said, I never spoke to a black person until I was 25. But after hearing about your story, I'm going to read this book 
and I'm going to give it to my grandchildren. And for her to tell me that story and to, it, it, it made such a, an impact on me. It didn't matter that most of the people in the, in the room weren't that impressed with the book um, or the story, but she needed to hear it. So there's been connections like that. And it, it's, it's, been, it's been quite a, you know, those are little bridges, big bridges, yeah. little bridges, so. But yes. significant. And and you don't you you make a difference every day with whatever however you live your life it affects other people. So agreed. Yes. So and we have one more question that is actually a two part question. Um, what was the most important takeaway from your collaboration, and do you have any recommendations for educators or administrators? Well, I'll let the author answer that one first. Which part? Take away from the collaboration? Um, it's, it's just been uh, an opportunity to, to have these conversations. That's what we, that's why I wrote the book. I had hoped that people would read the, read the stories and understand the history uh, from 50 years ago, take a look at the way things were 50 years ago, take a look at how things are today. And there's been a lot of changes. There's been a lot of improvements and we still have a lot to do. I mean, there's a lot of people in this group that I know that are working towards equity in schools and equity in, in, uh, in their lives. Uh, there are Black Lives Matter kinds of issues. Um, my granddaughter is in a Black Lives Matter group. There's just so many ways that, um, that people are being affected by our collaboration and our conversations. I think it, it's, and it, that's what I think. What do you think? I think many, many fruits from our collaboration, um, um, just the people and relationships I've, I've made, you know, by, by coming public with this, uh, 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 with your speaking engagement. Um, I hope to address um, that class of 1970 uh, alumni group uh, in the not so distant future and, and to learn even more from them. Um, that second part, and that's just one of the many fruits, but that second part of, uh, of, of I remember hearing what can administrators do. Uh, and, and when I heard that, it reminded me of, of one of our most prolific um, American educational researchers, uh, researchers contemporary, Dr. Rich Milner. Uh, you know, he describes this moment that we're in, you know, when we're asking the question, you know, you know, what's, what can we do, you know, to further this thing? You know, he, he describes this, um, uh, this phenomenon, you know, we got this, you know, there's a, there's a woke movement or you got a woke crowd now that, you know, within education is, you know, they're, they're, they're reading the articles and they, they want to do this work. And to some extent, you know, these issues are now in vogue, you know, and the thing about it, you know, for everybody who's ad adopting or accepting a more critical uh, 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 approach toward issues of race, you know, the, the trick is, yeah, we need more people to stand in this moment and be critical but 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 that's the easy part you know just don't critique you know as an administrator you have the power to see let the data show if there's an over over representation uh, of certain st students in a in a negative uh, outcome well then use that critiquing power to do something about it and move it forward move move the uh, uh, the progress uh, forward in your school or at your district so I think that question is, is is very important you know administrators have a lot of power black administrators have a lot of power white administrators have a lot of power American administrators coalesce today you know, on the issues of fairness, not, not any political ideology, but just American educators committed to doing what's good for students, not bad, doing what's right for students, not what's wrong. You know, that's what administrators can do. We, we are at a point where we can all open our eyes. We have decades of scholarship, you know, that, that show the inequities in education. So my charge, you know, and, and you didn't ask for it, whoever asked that question, but my charge, for progressive-minded, 
you know, progressive in the doing sense, not in some political sense. But those who understand education from its foundational histories, you know, there's certain things we've kept in education from the colonial period. You know, you know, we, we, we keep what we like and we throw out the rest. Well, now is the time for administrators like you, whoever asked that question, uh, to honestly be bold enough to throw out those practices and policies that do black students no good. Well, I can I can add to that and I'd like to add to it in a couple of ways. Um, I think that the answers to a lot of the educational issues lie right now with students that are in high school and in college and to encourage more children, uh, students of, that are diverse to go into the teaching profession. And it is up to other to educators, teachers now, administrators, when you see a student that you think would make a good teacher, and that, that's, that young person is not thinking about teaching, but you see that, it's time to encourage that. Um, there was this past four weeks, uh, there was a program, I've written it down because I won't remember the whole thing, Third annual New Jersey convening on diversifying the teacher workforce, a virtual conference. It ended uh, on Wednesday. And it was hosted by Dr. Nora Hyland, a Rutgers Associate Dean of the Graduate School, and moderated by Dr. Edward Fergus, a professor of urban education and policy at Temple University. And I got to participate in some of those sessions, and there were some powerful keynotes. But the most, the best parts were the panels that they had. And the panel discussion on Wednesday, Dr. Fergus led four young people. Uh, one was a, high, a college senior going into the teaching career. Another is a doctoral candidate in the Graduate School of Education. She's also teaching in the schools, in a, a local public school. Another, the other two, um, our teachers in public schools. One is a doctor of education, another is, um, uh, I think, might be a, an arts teacher. But each of them told their stories of how they had not intended to become teachers, but people saw in them something that uh, it, it just connected for them. They had an opportunity. So it's up to the teachers of today, the administrators of today to take a look at encouraging students of diverse, uh, representing the diverse populations of the different schools that they, and towns that they live in. I never had a teacher of color all through my school career. I missed learning about things when I was a younger person. When I was a teacher, uh, one of the districts that I worked in had a high um, population of Spanish speaking and uh, Chinese speaking, Mandarin, uh, Gujarati, Indian. So there was a diverseness in the community and the teachers, they, we also had teachers to represent those students. But we need to do more of that. We need to diversify the, uh, the teaching staff. And that's what this whole conference was about. And it was the third year that the conference was going on. I think it's something that I know that many, maybe a lot of the people on this call know about that, but that's the kind of work that we as educators need to take a look at. Get teachers of, to, to represent the diverse groups and retain them in, in the teaching uh, profession. So I think that we're probably out of time. Um, and yeah, I think we stood on our soapboxes uh, enough, Brandy. Are, do we need to come off our soapboxes or? I think so, we are out of time, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanna thank everyone for joining us and taking, listen to us. We're all experiencing life-changing events due to this pandemic, but the one thing about these opportunities to participate in a Zoom call is that we, we can be from many places. And I know that there's people on this call that um, we couldn't have driven here. So thank you very much for participating and 
I hope that we've built some more bridges. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, again, just, uh, just echoing what Marilyn said in the beginning, the Rutgers Graduate School Alumni Association, um, as well as the Samuel Dewitt Proctor Institute, really thank you for joining us today. Um, and Eileen and Michael, thank you for sharing your wisdom as well. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you for having us, Brandy. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good night.